It's moving time for Hubert Davis and the North Carolina Tar Heels as we hit the midpoint of the ACC schedule. If Carolina wants to go on a run similar to last year, now's the time. You are Locked on Tar Heels, your daily podcast on the UNC Tar Heels, part of the Locked on Podcast Network, your team every day. Hey there, it's Tuesday, January 24th, 2023. Welcome into the Locked on Tar Heels podcast, the only daily North Carolina show out there. I'm your host, Isaac Shade, and I want to thank you so much for hanging out with me today as we talk Carolina Athletics. By the way, this episode is brought to you by FanDuel Sportsbook, the official sportsbook of Locked On. Make every moment more. Visit FanDuel.com slash Locked On today to get started. A quick reminder for you, we've got a mailbag show coming up on Friday. Make sure you're submitting your questions. Now already got a great base of questions coming in, but have room for more if you would like to submit it. You can do that on Twitter. You can email the show LockedOnTarHeels at gmail.com. Coming up today, we've got a primer of the Syracuse game. We're going to talk about their personnel, what their season's been like, what to watch for. Always going to give you my uh, several W2W4s. Um, But before we get there, I do want to set the stage a bit at this midpoint of the ACC schedule so we can kind of process what's happened, what's to come, where we're at, all of that kind of stuff. So as I said off the top, If North Carolina is going to make a run, now is the time. And boy, does the schedule look a little bit, I don't know if I'd say ominous, but it toughens up in something of a big way. And so we're going to get our brains wrapped around that. Uh, In the new AP poll on Monday, Carolina was in the others receiving votes coming in at 31st. Um, and so that that kind of gives you a frame of reference for where people think they're at nationally at this point. And in terms of ACC play, as soon as this, Syracuse is game 10 of the ACC schedule. So once this game is over on, on tonight, on Tuesday night, Carolina will have played half of the ACC schedule. And at that point, they're either going to be seven and three or six and four. And those feel, I know it's just one game different, but they feel massively different to me, especially when you look at the log jam in the middle of the ACC right now. So bunched up. The interesting thing is, is that we, as we look at the rest of the ACC schedule, Carolina has this whole stretch of playing teams right around them in the standings of the ACC. We'll we'll talk more in depth about that here in just a second. Now, As far as that stretch, Carolina took care of the first game of it against NC State on Saturday. Uh, Carolina and NC State were right there together by virtue of winning. The Tar Heels are six and three. NC State is five and four. And that's what you got to do. You got to keep winning these just one at a time to put yourself a game or two games or whatever above those teams that you're trying to send below you and move yourself up or at least stay up in the conference standings where Carolina is currently tied for third. Really interestingly, really helpfully, right where the conference standings were at heading into the weekend, Carolina was sandwiched right in between NC State and Syracuse. And again, they've already taken care of NC State, and now you want to do the same with Syracuse, who is also 6-3 and three right now in the ACC, just like Carolina. So let me lay it out for you uh, in a little more specific detail what's all going on around Carolina um, in terms of who's there and what this um, after Syracuse, what the final 10 games will look like. Because here it is, of the final 12 ACC games, so starting with NC State on Saturday, 10 of those 12 games that are remaining are against teams currently within one game above or below North Carolina in the ACC standings. Let me say that one more time, make sure we're all wrapping around our he- wrapping our heads around what I'm saying. Carolina, starting with NC State, had 12 more ACC games. As of right now, 10 of those 12 are against teams somewhere in the vicinity of either one game better than Carolina in ACC record, one game worse than Carolina in ACC record, or tied with Carolina at ACC record. The lone uh, 
um, stand exceptions to that are Clemson, who's eight and one atop the ACC right now, and Notre Dame, who's the opposite, one and eight. All the others, Carolina six and three. All the others are either seven and two, six and three, or five and four of the other. 10 of those final 12 games. So you want to do this. You want to go on a run to separate yourself from these teams. Let me talk us through it. So literally right as of the time of this recording, exactly one third of the ACC is tied for third at six and three. There are 15 teams in the conference. Five of them right now are six and three. And so again, as you see it, Carolina can really, really help themselves by doing well here. Here's the order of the final 10, or excuse me, 11 games, NC State, and then at Syracuse tonight, who's six and three, then versus Pittsburgh at home, who's six and three. Carolina has already lost them. You really want to get this win so that you kind of even up the tiebreaker there. Then you're at Duke, who is now five and four after losing to Virginia Tech on Tuesday night. Then you're at Wake Forest, one of the other six and three teams. Then you host Clemson really want to get that one if you're trying to get the first place in the conference, right? Um, and then you host Miami, another one of the six and three teams. Then you go to NC State, who's five and four right now. Then you go to Notre Dame, who's one and eight. Carolina has often struggled in South Bend. Then you host Virginia, who's seven and two, one game above Carolina. Again, that's another one you want to get similar to Pittsburgh because you want to even up that tiebreaker after having lost to Virginia. And then you go to Florida State, who despite having a really, really rough start to the season in out of in non-conference play is up to five and four in ACC play. And so Tallahassee, that is not going to be an easy trip. And then you finish it all off hosting Duke on senior night, who we've already said is five and four. And so you see how bunched up that all is. It's insane. But if Carolina can do what they need to do, they can distinguish themselves, they can separate themselves, and be right there at the very least in that top four to get a double buy in the ACC tournament, help their NCAA tournament seeding. But you don't want to settle for that. Carolina very much still has um, winning the, the ACC regular season in their sights. But you got a lot of work to do. you got to keep bringing things together. But the good news... Is that as I said, there's all these five teams tied in third place right now, but there's only two teams ahead of you because Clemson has sole possession of first place at eight and one, and Virginia has sole possession of second place at seven and two. So it's not like you got to overcome all these teams that are above you, it's just two teams above you, and then a bunch tied with you and right below you. And again, it's also important to get these wins because of tiebreaker scenarios. Like you don't want to be looking at scenarios where you're tied with the team in terms of record, but they hold a tiebreaker over you. And so um, you, you get that um, option to, or opportunity, I should say, to play Pittsburgh again, even that one out at home. You get an opportunity to play Virginia again and even that one out at home. And you have, you have to do that. Unfortunately, Carolina can't uh, get back the game they lost at Virginia Tech, but Virginia Tech's going to be below them in their standings. And so in the ACC standings, and so you're not too terribly crushed about, I mean, you wish you had won that game, but it's probably not going to come into play that Virginia Tech holds that tiebreaker. So all of this to say, Carolina has a tough road to hoe ahead of them, but it's very doable if Carolina can do what they need to do, start finding more and more and more of that role definition that they found down the stretch last year and go to work. Just got to keep relying on these guys to find out who they are and come in to bring it all together. And then you're going to be right where you want to be come March. But you got to take care of business game after game after game. And that starts tonight at Syracuse. Speaking of, what do you need to know about Jim Beheim's team? Aside from the fact that they're going to play a 2-3 zone. And aside from the fact that finally, there are no more Beheims on the current playing roster. Well, I'll tell you much more about it in a minute. But first, let me tell you about our brand new sponsor here on the Locked On Network, FanDuel. The NFL playoffs are here, and we're really excited about our brand new sports betting partner for Locked On because they are the number one sports book in America. That's FanDuel. If you're new to FanDuel, that's even better. They have so many great features that make betting on sports fun and easy. 
So new customers, join today to get started with $150 in free bets guaranteed when you place your first $5 bet. Just sign up at fanduel.com slash locked on. FanDuel has all your favorite bets from the money line to point spreads to player props. Plus, you can even combine your bets for a chance at a bigger payout with same game parlay. The lines for the conference championship games for the NFL are already out. The Eagles are favored by two and a half over the 49ers and the Chiefs by one and a half over the Bengals. All on an app that's safe, secure, and super easy to use. So football fans, don't miss out. Place your first $5 bet to get $150 free dollars of bets. Win or lose at FanDuel.com slash locked on. Make every moment more fun with FanDuel official sportsbook partner of the NFL. Great stuff there. So glad to have FanDuel as our new betting sponsor. Also, make sure to check out for your second listen today, our brand new podcast, Locked on College Basketball. Everything you need to know about college basketball all in one place. Plus, hear from big game experts, insiders, coaches, and players. Locked on College Basketball, available on YouTube and wherever you get podcasts all right folks here it is north carolina at syracuse tonight tuesday january 24th it's one of those late ones unfortunately 9 p.m eastern time inside not the carrier dome that's not the name anymore it is the jma wireless dome you can catch this game on espn FanDuel has it at carolina by four and a half with an over under set at 149.5 Five. One of the biggest storylines for this one, before I get you ready to, to meet Syracuse and who they are, Carolina's looking for just their second true road win of the season. And in some ways, you kind of look at it at the fir- as the first, because the other one was at Louisville, and they're terrible. So really, you got to go out, you got to figure out how to win on the road because that's how doing what we talked about in the first segment, separating yourself, you do that in conference play by figuring out how to be road dogs and go out and get it. That's what we're looking for tonight. All right, Syracuse comes in at 13 and seven, six and three in the ACC. They're one, again, one of those five teams tied in third place. Interestingly, of their three ACC losses, Two of them are to the two of the same schools that Carolina has lost to Pitt and Virginia. And their other is to Miami. So all understandable ACC losses there. But in totality, they have two unsavory losses, one to Colgate and one to Bryant. One of those is a quad three loss. One of those is a quad four loss. That is very ungood. Yeah, I just said ungood <laughs> on Syracuse's resume. In terms of their best win, ah... Uh, Virginia Tech at home, and I say that because Virginia Tech's a good team, but they've been struggling. They had been without Hunter Couture for quite a while, but outside of that game, legitimately, Syracuse hasn't beaten anyone of note. No other team inside the Ken Palm top 100. They're 0-3 in quad one games. They're 1-2 in quad two games, the lone win being that Virginia Tech win. Literally, all of their other 12 wins are against quad three and quad four opponents. Now, w- when you combine all that, Syracuse has only played six total quad one and quad two games. Carolina has played more quad one games alone, seven of them. And so, as you see, my point there, North Carolina is infinitely more battle tested, has one of the greatest strengths of schedules in the country, in particular in the non-conference part of the schedule, where Syracuse did not do anything to test themselves as Carolina did. And so that is hopefully a helpful thing. But again, you got to learn how to get on the road and win a game. Let's talk about Syracuse's personnel. They've been very consistent with their starting lineup all season. Jim Beheim has of their 20 games. Uh, They've had just two different starting lineups and one of them they've used 19 times this season. And so that's what we'll expect to see tonight. Let me lay it out for you. Freshman Chris Bell, 6'7", forward coming in there. Uh, Two of the stalwarts, Jesse Edwards, 6'11", center. He is the dude in the middle uh, of that zone, taking up all the space. Out front in the backcourt, the other uh, stalwart is Joe Girard, 6'1" one guard 
And then you have a, a second freshman, but this is the dude, Judah Mintz. He is a stud freshman, 6'3 guard. So he's in the backcourt there with Joe Girard. And then the other starter is Benny Williams, a 6'8 forward. In terms of guys off the bench, Jim Beheim, Jim Beheim has nine players averaging double din- digit minutes. And so we'll see uh, more rotation than we typically do with the Hubert Davis squad. The other guys you'll see coming in and out most likely are Malik Brown, Justin Taylor, Samir Torrance, and John Ball, a Jack. So be on the lookout for those guys coming off the bench. Again, Gerard Edwards, these are the senior leaders. These are the veterans, the guys that have been around the pro. They're not transfers. They've been at Syracuse now for years. So these are the guys you've seen before. These are the guys you're aware of. Uh, it's important for Bayheim's zone because it is your guy in the middle and it is your main guard. And so be on the lookout for that. Carolina will try to disrupt them. But Judah Mintz, whoo. He is right behind, for me, Duke's Kyle Filipowski, second place in the ACC Freshman of the Year standings. Again, this is my estimation, but many others would agree with that. He's averaging 14.9 points per game, second leading score behind Joe Girard. Also, this dude is a thief, Judah Mintz, leads the ACC in steals at two per game game. So Carolina coming off a game where they had a season low seven turnovers, it's going to have to hold on to the ball well, particularly in the backcourt where Judah Mintz will be looking to do work. Now, I mentioned that Mintz is second in scoring to Joe Girard. Girard comes in at 17 and a half per game, fifth in the ACC. Obviously, that's behind Baycott and some of these other great scores in the conference that you already are aware of. Turquavion Smith, L. Ellis and Tyree Appleby are the others in the top five, all guys that Carolina has already seen this season. Now, as you think back to prior matchups with Carolina and Syracuse, Joe Girard had some big time games last year, but Carolina was one of the few teams that held him under double digits in scoring. He had just nine points in the lone matchup against the Tar Heels last year. So you really want to do that again, shorter guys, six foot one. And so you expect to see RJ Davis on him because they do have height in other places. It's not one of those situations where I would expect to see Leaky Black on Joe Girard, uh, again, just because of some of that other height. Now, we'll we'll see what the matchups are like based on who's subbing in and out. As for Jesse Edwards, listen, second in ACC and rebounding behind only, who else? Armando Baycott. But Edwards leads the conference in blocks at 2.8 blocks per game, sixth in all of Division I. And so this guy is going to be looking to block some shots. And along with Armando Baycott, pretty cool. One of just four guys in the conference averaging a double-double this season. And you're going to see two of them, Armando and Jesse Edwards, in this game going at it. Should be a lot of fun there. What is Syracuse really good at? Well, you know the zone, and we're going to talk more about the zone in the what to watch for, so we'll put a pin in that. But what they're really good at is what I just talked about with Jesse Edwards, blocks. And that's really about it in terms of what they excel at and are elite at at the national level. And and really, they I mean, legitimately phenomenal shot blockers, and it's mostly because of Jesse Edwards. Um, And so what do you do to neutralize that? You don't shy away from it. You go at a shot blocker. Don't give him room to get his arms extended to block your shot. So I want to see RJ Davis. I want to see Caleb Love drive at Edwards if, if and when they can drive the zone to do those kind of things. When you can attack, you do and um, probably won't be able to get in, uh, get him into foul trouble because that's difficult against the zone. But when you're attacking, maybe so we'll just have to wait and see. A couple others intangibles that do stand out for Syracuse that they're at least good at is they're second in the conference in assists per game. So they share the ball well. Carolina is going to have to stay um, tough on their man-to-man defense. And then also they are second in the conference in steals per game. And so uh, you heard me talk about already with, with Judah Mintz and what he can do leading the conference in steals. So Carolina is going to have to be Uh, mindful of maintaining the ball. They had not done well in the three games prior to the NC State game at taking care of the ball. So they're going to have to put a premium on that. RJ Davis, Caleb Love, DeMarco Dunn, Seth Trimble, all these guys, when they are the ball handlers, going to have to do that. Well, that is what to know from the Syracuse side of things. I want to wrap up today's show with my W2, W4, the what to watch fours. I got five of them for you today, and we'll hit that in just a second. 
All right, here we go. Wrapping up today's show, what to watch for. Let me give it to you. Number one, of course, this is where we got to go first and foremost as we talk about Syracuse. It's attacking the zone. The key with this, if you've never heard me or others talk about it, is to get to the high post. Now, if, if you're not familiar with basketball terms or positions on the court, that's okay. Let me give it to you quickly. The high post is basically the area between the free throw line and the top of the key. So it's like that semicircle, right? Like each edge of the free throw line all the way up to the top of the key. So that semicircle right there. That's kind of the soft spot in Syracuse's 2-3 zone where you can sneak in and facilitate. So what you want to do is bring the ball up, get it right there, sneak a guy in to operate, and then you can um, try to draw the zone in. You can kick out for shots, or you can try to suck up uh, like Jesse Edwards from that center position, pass over him to find somebody cutting baseline behind the defense. So that's some of the things you're trying to do. Now, obviously, one of the things Jim Beheim does is recruit length. He wants long guys up top in the zone to make it hard to get it um, into that high post position. And so Carolina's going to have to move the ball, get it out to the wings, um, use that to pass inside, make some cuts, things of that nature. And so what you're always looking for is who is the person that you want to get into that high post to be your facilitator to that soft spot in the zone. You want somebody tall who can see over the zone, somebody that's a good passer. So basically summing all that up, you want it to be your best facilitator who is big. Now it's funny kind of throughout a lot of the season, I hadn't really put much thought into it. And my gut reaction was like, Oh yeah, get Mondo into the high post and let Baycott operate there. Um, his passing has improved this season. He's doing a lot better at that. But then I actually kind of leading up to the game now have stopped to put some time into it. And friends, here's where I'm at. This game, this is Pete Nance's moment. This is Pete Nance's time to shine. If I'm Hubert Davis, what do I know that Pete Nance is awesome at being tall and being a great teammate who can facilitate really, really well. So what do I do? I'm going to send Pete Nance into that high post to be the operator, to be the facilitator. What does that allow? Well, if, if I'm RJ Davis bringing the ball up, I get it in the Nance. Then I can find love out on the wings, maybe leaky in the corner. Maybe if I'm drawing up Jesse Edwards, who's lurking down on the baseline? Oh, you know Armando Baycott is there waiting to eat. And Carolina historically has made a killing on these big-to-big -big passes against Syracuse. If you remember some of those years like uh, the 2015-16 season or the 16-17 season, like in 15-16, the, the big-to-big passing between Kennedy Meeks and Bryce Johnson, like Bryce Johnson getting that high post and just abusing Syracuse's zone was something beautiful to watch. And so that's the kind of thing you're waiting to see. Now, if it was what we expect to be a typical Hubert Davis team, you, you imagine like, hey, do that. And like RJ, make the pass, uh, move, get get open on the wing or wherever. And you just want these dudes that shooters all over the court to fill it up. That's not been this team's calling card. Like last year, it's been RJ. And then kind of, you get a couple dudes every now and again, and we'll talk more about that here in a second, but uh, that's what you're looking for. I want to see Pete Nance as the main facilitator in the middle of the zone. So watch for that. And then secondarily, Again, I'm, I'm now sold on don't have it be Baycott. I mean, it, it's fine, but more often than not, I want Baycott operating behind the zone on the baseline. Um, and so secondarily, when it's not Pete Nance, I want it to be leaky. Uh, I, he's such a good facilitator. He's tall enough at 6'9 to see over things and make smart passes. Uh, if Puff Johnson's available in this game, I think he would be a great uh, facilitator distributor as well. And so those are kind of the guys you're looking for in the middle. So keep an eye on that. When Carolina's on offense, sneaking a guy into that high post and then operating from there. Keep your eyes peeled. Number two, what to watch for. Armando Baycott has to keep doing what he's been doing. Since returning after missing the majority of the Virginia game, so three games since then, that would be Louisville, that would be Boston College, that would be NC State. Against Louisville, 14 points, 16 rebounds. Surprised even that he played that game, but there you go. 
against Boston College, 20 points, 16 rebounds, and then Saturday against NC State, 23 and 18. So that means in those three games, since returning from that ankle injury, he's averaging in those three games, 19 points and 16.7 rebounds a game. You got to keep taking advantage of this. I don't know how many times I got to keep saying it, but you got to pound the ball into Mondo over and over and over. Now, that's a different scenario against the zone, but Carolina historically has handled that really well, particularly under Roy Williams. And so Hubert Davis has learned a thing or two from that man patrolling the sidelines, and you think Carolina should be able to do that. Now, some guys you worry, thinking about Armando Baycott, some guys you worry that under the pressure of moving towards a record as he was doing heading up to NC State might fold under some of that pressure of a record, both the double-double and rebounding record. Not Mondo. He, like, thrived under that, like, looking forward to it. And so I loved it. I loved it. I know folks were concerned with him paying too much attention to it from some of his remarks at at a press conference last week. Nothing to be worried about. Mondo did great. But what I'm looking for is what does he do next? Right now, as we've talked about, he moves into eighth on the all-time ACC rebounding list with two Dukies ahead of him and in sight. And so we'll start to make movement there. But the bottom line is, I said you want Mondo to keep doing what he's doing. If you want him to keep doing what he's doing, you got to attack the zone smartly so that you can put him in position to succeed. Number three on what to watch for. Keep riding RJ Davis. I've said it quite a few times recently, but it's you know, Caleb, Caleb is finding his way here and there, but it's mostly been a two headed attack with Mondo and RJ. These two guys have been indispensable for this team. And RJ is riding some kind of hot streak. You heard me talk about it yesterday. I'm not going to break down the numbers again, but just remember RJ is in fuego right now. And so um, as long as you you might've noticed in the second half against NC state, Um, got fouled. I think it was the foul to put Carolina in the bonus with like 13 minutes still to go in the second half. Something happened. It looked like to his shooting hand when he got fouled and fell. And so as long as that's hopefully not bothering him, man, just keep riding RJ shooting. RJ's attacking. RJ's getting to the free throw line. You're going to get to the free throw line less in this game because of the zone, but do that as much as you can. Speaking of which, I mentioned this a little bit ago with the three-point shooting, but number four on what to watch for, who's going to be the other guy? Because against a zone, if if you're wanting to attack it from the outside, it cannot just be RJ. Someone else is going to have to hit consistently from the outside, whether it's Caleb, whom you expect and you hope to be that guy. I just keep waiting for that breakout. When's it coming? You know it's going to come. He's too good of a shooter and it's going to happen. But, but if not, or in addition to RJ and Caleb, could it be DeMarco Dunn? His shot's been looking really nice. Might Leaky hit one or two from the corner? Does Nance himself knock down a couple when he's not facilitating in the middle? Might he step outside? Uh, might this be a game where Jalen Washington or Tyler Nickel comes in and knocks one or two down from the perimeter? We will see. So keep an eye on that. And then fifth, I said I got five what to watch fours. Usually we do four. But I want to, I'm just super interested to see because one of the truths about playing a zone is you don't get to the free throw line much because the zone doesn't foul much because it kind of teases you into taking a lot of shots, either mid range or threes or whatever it is. So, how does Carolina utilize and rely on one of their single best assets this season, which is the free throw line, both getting there and converting while they're there against a team that doesn't foul much, again, because of the zone? You got to keep attacking when and where you can get, get there. And, and Carolina, listen, they're not going to shoot 39 free throws like they did against NC state. I'm looking even to see, can they get like 15 to 20? Like to me, that would be a massive win. If they could have that many attempts in this game, that's going to be hard. And it's got to be a commitment, got to be committed to doing the things you need to do to succeed in the way that you can this season. Ah, should be a fun one tonight at Syracuse. Again, hopefully Carolina can pick up that second road win of the season. All right, friends, that's it for today's episode of Locked on Tar Heels. Once again, don't forget there's a mailbag episode coming up on Friday. You can share questions with us on Twitter, either my personal DM or the show's DMs on Twitter. You can email us, lockedontarheels at gmail.com. 
gmail.com. Don't forget to subscribe to the show, smash the like button, and leave some great comments. Also, check out Locked On College Basketball. Myself and Andy Patton bring you everything you need to know on and off the court. Plus, hear from other big name experts, coaches, and players throughout the basketball landscape. Locked On College Basketball, available on Odyssey, YouTube, and anywhere else you get podcasts. Been so great hanging out. Can't wait for this game tomorrow. Uh, excuse me, tonight. And you know that Coach Pat Kilby and I will be unpacking it on tomorrow's show. Should be a blast. Until then, let me remind you that it's always a great day to be a Tar Heel. But for now, peace. <laughs>